welcome to the Bookman Show. I'm your host, James Renford Powell. And of course, this is the show where we talk about the what, who, where, when, why, and how you can get your book into print. But really, we talk about books, and our guests are generally authors or experts on a particular book. And we've, we've covered a wide, wide range of books. And this week, we're going to be talking about a book that is probably uh, the second highest seller next to the Bible. It's the book, big, known as the big book. It's Alcoholics Anonymous book. And our guest today is Mona Sides Smith. And Mona is the widow of Buddy Smitty. Smitty. He was called Smitty, uh, who was Dr. Bob Smith's son. And Dr. Bob Smith and Dr. and rather Bill Wilson were the our acknowledged founders, even though they had a lot of help from their, from their spouses, uh, and the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, uh, this has been a, an organization that has been a very powerful uh, effect for good. Uh, in fact, I'd like to read you a statement by Dr. David Hawkins, who is a world famous. Uh, Psychiatrist, or was a world famous psychiatrist and teacher uh, in New York and in the UK. And uh, this is what Dr. Hawkins has to say about it. He says in his book, Healing and Self Discovery, a good example of such pure teaching in our society is that of Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. AA takes no position about whether you drink or not. It does not try to close up the liquor industry or try to convince you to stop drinking. However, it does say that for those who have a problem, this is what we do. And these are the results. If you continue to drink, these will be the results. There is no making wrong or or invalidation. No one is looking for any power, nor do they wish to exploit anyone. AA has no possessions, no royalty, no government, no building, and no glamour. It is just pure spiritual principle that allows an individual to have the freedom to see the truth in it for oneself and to apply it in one's own life if desired. A very, very complimentary statement, uh, Mona. Thank you very much for being with us today. Now, uh, Smitty was Dr. Bob's son. Yes. So you you were able to meet all of these people that are now rather famous. Well, <laughs> yes, I I never met Dr. Bob personally. Uh-huh. He he died when I was in high school, mm-hmm. and I was not married or connected to the family at that time. Mm-hmm. So I never met him or. Um, or my mother-in-law, and I did meet Bill Wilson and Lois, and was a guest in their home, and mm. and um, was on a, a speaking tours with them occasionally at that time, and that was. Um, well, you would have a, a, a real insight into how this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, came about. Could you tell the viewers about that? I was a little child when it came about, but but, uh, I I can tell you and and you how it did begin. And it was not um, a complicated thing to have happen. And what you read was, was very good paragraph on just how the organization is but this book is uh, this is a cover from the fourth edition and there have been hundred editions I mean really? hundred not not editions but printings of mm-hmm. each edition is reprinted a, a lot I noticed the the book I have wrapped in the, the fourth edition is actually a third, a third edition of copy. I don't even know what mine. I don't even know what mine is. Um, I've never checked it. Right. It okay. may be the same as mine, yeah. but I noticed the price for this book 
which is the third edition, was three dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> the, the the book is sells for a very low price. They, mm. they uh, on purpose. Yes, they have their own printing company and they sell it on purpose. And it's often now five dollars or seven dollars. I got a copy of it on my Kindle for a dollar ninety-nine. <laughs> so it's. Um, its beginning was after AA began, mm -hmm. and Alcoholics Anonymous was not called that until this book was printed. And it was, the, the printer named this book Alcoholics Anonymous because it didn't have a name at mm -hmm. the time. And from, from that time on, that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. Um, and no one had an idea that the organization would be as as broad as it is today and as many people out out there who are members there are millions of people in hundreds of countries now when they have their uh, their five year Every five years, there's an international convention, and it takes a large city to to, to accommodate. accommodate it. And AA will uh, um, reserve all the hotels in in Montreal or Seattle or Milwaukee or Minneapolis, St. Paul. They reserve all the hotels, and then um, you book through. AA into into those and it fills the whole town. I remember uh, I went to one in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that um, was the whole town was full of, of members and friends and family from from AA and there was a big march from one stadium across Minneapolis to another, and there were a lot of policemen stationed along the way because the, the, here was thousands and thousands of alcoholics mm -hmm. coming to town, and so a lot of police were out, and they were not doing they were not doing anything. A lot of people to pick up trash were out. There was no trash, and I asked one of the policemen. Um, how it was going and and he said he said well the main thing I've noticed with this group is there's a lot of hugging <laughs> so they they went across when it was in New Orleans uh, and New Orleans is too small now to accommodate it but in uh, many years ago in the 1960 uh, maybe I so, it's a long time ago it uh, New Orleans um, on, they had a picture in Monday morning in the Times Picayune that showed New Orleans that the cleanup people had nothing to do. The, new, they said New Orleans was cleaner when the AA people left than it was that when was they arrived because they were picking up trash <laughs> and throwing it away. So it's it has a cities now like having them come they. They don't buy any alcohol to speak of, uh, but they do a lot of shopping. And the other businesses have, do a good business at that time. In, um, in New Orleans, which is famous for its, its drinks like hurric the hurricane yeah. and such, they had soft ice cream machines set up in their bars. And people could go in and get um, what they called virgin hurricanes and soft ice cream, and and they did a big financial business. Big coffee business, I imagine. Big <laughs> coffee business, very big, and donuts <laughs> business there. Well, the the um, the the creation of the book came how how long after Bob and Bill met? Bob and Bill met in 1935, and the, this book. It was four years in coming. It was published in 1939. 
that was the first edition, and it it has it is the basic text still for the the organization for the operation of Alcoholics Anonymous and the other 12-step groups that have sprung up from AA. Many of them use this book. Overeaters Anonymous, for instance, uses this text and you'll, you'll see their copies where the members have crossed out everywhere alcohol is there and written food above it as, as the food edition. They utilize the same book. They utilize the same book. They don't even print their own. And some drug rehabilitation? Almost all um, drug rehab, alcohol and drug, uh, other alcohol and other drugs. Alcohol also is a drug. They use the same 12 steps and the, the same text and take their people to 12-step meetings. So it has become the basic text for all of these. And the first, the first portion of this book, which is about 164 pages, it's just this, this small bit right here, is unchanged. This is the basic book. That was from which page to which? It was from, it's from page um, 1 to, um, to 164. And then everything else has been added over. Everything else has been, some of it has been changed. These, these last are stories by uh, alcoholics who are in recovery. And it's their personal stories, including Dr. Bob's mm -hmm. personal story. Well, your, your, um, your story from the inside, from the family there, about the meeting of, of Bob and Bill, I think would be interesting for our listeners to know just what kind of beginnings all of this had. I would be happy to talk about yeah. that. I think it's, it's uh, of course, I would think it's interesting. Well, it's quite inspiring as yes. well. Bill Wilson was sober in 1935, and he he was a stockbroker in New York City who had gone to Akron, Ohio to make a contact with a business there and to get their... Okay. I, I, um, uh, it's our society today. That's, Tim. that's okay, don't worry. It's what we do. Uh, he had gone to Akron, Ohio to talk with some people about g getting their business as a stockbroker, and that had failed. And he, there he was, stuck in Akron, Ohio, where he um, was in the hotel and looking at the bar in the hotel and was out of money, didn't know what to do. So he went to the telephone in the lobby and started calling ministers in Akron and got no answer until he got uh, uh, Reverend Tunks who talked to him and put him in touch with Henrietta Cyberling, who was with the Cyberling Tire Company. Uh, Akron was made lots of tires at that time. They did. They were the rubber capital of the world. They even were the, made the rub, first rubber duckies there. So he put her in. He, she put Bill in touch with Henrietta, who was also a member of the Oxford group, where Bob Smith was an alcoholic doctor in Akron, who with his wife, they attended the Oxford group meetings. And so Henrietta was the one who told Bill, yes, I know an alcoholic. And Bill was looking for another alcoholic to talk to. It's, that's the, the connection that gets people sober, is talking with someone who has walked that walk. So she put him in touch with the Smith household and Ann Smith, Dr. Bob's wife, answered the phone 
and Dr. Bob had, this was the day before Mother's Day in 1935, and Dr. Bob had come home drunk with a potted plant for Anne. He had put the plant on the dining room table and had gone upstairs and passed out. And Anne said, he's upstairs, passed out, but I will get him there tomorrow. We will be there tomorrow. So Henrietta put Bill up for the night, and, and the next morning, uh, Dr. Bob didn't want to go. He was hungover and, and didn't want to go. But he said, okay, I'll give this bird 15 minutes, <laughs> no more. And then my husband, it was not my husband then, he was a 17-year-old mm -hmm. uh, young man who didn't want to go, but he was the only one in the family who, who could drive besides Dr. Bob and couldn't drive. So he drove them over, and they got to Henrietta's about four in the afternoon. It took all day to get Bob ready to, to go. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, they got to the Cyberling estate where Henrietta was living in the gatehouse. It was a three, four room little house on a, a palatial estate where she had been divorced by the one of the cyberlings and had been sent to live in the gate, gatehouse. And they got there about four o'clock and they stayed until 11.15 think it was and they, they talked and talked and talked and that was the beginning of AA. Now that was not the the date of its beginning because Dr. Bob got drunk one more time after that. He went off to a convention, a medical convention in, uh, in, in Atlanta I think, another city and got started drinking and blacked out and the next thing he knew, he was back in Akron somehow at a friend's house. And after that, he never had another drink. That was in June. So AA began then, but they didn't know what it was. They were just two guys who were get sober. And they start, Bill had already been attending Oxford group meetings in New York. And he continued doing that, and Dr. Bob continued Oxford group meetings, but couldn't stay sober. Were the Oxford group meetings comparable to Alcoholics Anonymous? What it became, it, the meetings became, or is that on a different model? It's similar. Mm -hmm. It it um, expects certain things of people like. Uh, uh, con like confessing your mishaps, um, telling them to another person, uh, looking at your ca character defects, and uh, making restitution to people you have harmed, and then going out and carrying the message to other people of how this works, which is the basic uh, basics of the Oxford group, which is still in or, uh, still is exists, mm -hmm. but under different names. It was changed to Moral Rearmament, and I think it has a different name now. But but it's an international group that still and exists. its purpose is to work with alcoholics. Oxford group is not. They mm -hmm. work with all kinds of people. They. Uh, they circled around uh, Nelson Mandela in the apartheid um, problems many years ago. He was a member of the group, and they were supportive to him and his countries. And so they do it on a, a, a big international level like that, and they do it anonymously. And the people within the group do their work anonymously. And then that's what AA does, mm -hmm. also. Well, the um, were you when when they uh, started this? They, I mean, they didn't start from that night. No. That that meeting, no. something had to happen to to ignite the spark. It did ignite the spark. It 
um, and was so grateful to have somebody that Bob would talk to because she couldn't keep him sober despite searching him for liquor when he came in the house and he, he resorted to bringing home small bottles of liquor putting them in, in some heavy gloves and throwing them up on the back port the, the second story porch before he came in the house and then going out there and getting them when he went upstairs he had all kinds of hiding places for his alcohol she couldn't do anything so she invited Bill Wilson to come to their house and live with them for a while. He didn't have the money to get back home to his wife, Lois. So he stayed there and then Lois came out to Akron. Some, she had a job, so she was the income earner at that time. But Anne started the meetings, which developed into the AA meetings that are held everywhere today. And she started with um, every morning around the, the table in their small kitchen. The breakfast table. The breakfast table in, in, in the house on Ardmore Street in Akron, Ohio. Every morning, whoever was in the house, which was uh, two teenagers, uh, herself, Dr. Bob, Bill Wilson, and anyone else any other alcoholic that happened to show up to them and was invited to come and live there. The children went up to sleep in the attic and the rooms were, that they started taking in alcoholics at the time, but they all had to show up for breakfast. And she read from the book of James, from, uh, from guideposts, uh, from any spiritual things that she could find and they began discussing the things that the Oxford group were, were doing. And it, eventually they started writing it down in the beginning, it was the beginnings of these, this book. And, and Bill, who liked to promote things, he was the promoter, Dr. Bob was the spiritual guide in the in the group, and but Bill started writing these down, and they found um, from their sources, which were ancient wisdoms, and any books they could find. So it wasn't exclusively Christian origin. No, it 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 with Anne, she was a a Christian, so a lot of the beginnings were that. But this is non-denominational, ecumenical. It, it's, it, it's for anyone, Buddhists, Catholics, um, a, a Jewish, any, any and all religions, or atheists. So it's, it's principle-oriented. It's principle-oriented, yes. And, it's, and what works? It, it works. Yeah. It works on the principles. And it's, it's a spiritual program in, in that the unity of all things understanding the, the unity of all things is, is the, the spiritual basis of it. But the last, um, after page 164, these last and their recovery keeps the first few stories, which are stories of the founders originally, and then the rest of them some of them are changed, some are edited and renamed. So each edition has some different stories which are similar to the stories you would hear if you went to an open AA meeting that had a speaker. Mm -hmm. Th these are similar to the speakers. This, now, a, a typical AA meeting, you may have many speakers, many people witnessing their experience. There, there are different kinds of of 12-step meetings, all of them now, AA and Al-Anon and many of the others. And they, they have discussion meetings where everyone will talk. And they're, they're not therapy meetings. There's no therapist there who, who gives any advice or suggestion. People simply talk and the rest of them listen. 
and there's no feedback or crosstalk. You would talk, we all would listen, this person would talk, we would all listen. You would talk, we would all listen. And we, we learn from and identify if that if we were part of that meeting. So a lot of them are closed meetings, only alcoholics or only Al-Anon members. Some are open where any of us can go. Then that's one kind of meeting, is the discussion meeting. The other kind is a speaker meeting where someone would, would stand up and tell their story, similar to what one would be in the back of these books, and everyone would listen to the whole story, which would take up, that would be the whole program. And, and then people would say thank you and, and hu many hugs. There's <coughs> lots of hugging going on, as the Minneapolis policeman said. And then they, they go about their way. It's a very simple structure. We're going to take a, a brief break, and when we come back, we'll talk about what the 12 step program, how, what constitutes the 12 steps, and um, other um, sources, and more information from my guest today, Mona Side Smith. We'll be right back. James Renford Powell. My guest today is Mona Side Smith, who uh, is part of the family. The she's the widow of uh, Smitty, the son of Dr. Bob Smith, who is one of the founders, along with Bill Wilson. And we're talking about the book Alcoholics Anonymous book, which is said to be the second largest seller uh, next to the Bible. And we'll be uh, starting back and talking a little bit about how this uh, book is structured and, um, and a little bit more about the organization. I want to remind you that this program, The Bookman Show, is sponsored by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, the Church of Revelation, and One Community. And um, we are uh, available. You can find us by going to youtube.com typing in Renford Broadcast Network and there are six sections there maybe seven now our, our director of that is Jerry Bunting we have a section on the laws of material wealth personal development program you can watch the DVD there the first of four uh, DVDs uh, you can see this show uh, archived there also, the Core Concepts Lecture Series, where we invite people to come tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. In other words, how did they come to this belief system, and how is it manifesting in their lives? And we also have music with meaning, audio books, and uh, the Renford Theater, where you can find movies, uh, spiritual, metaphysical movies, that you might not be able to find or may have heard about but have not seen and we provide the links there so I also want to invite you to go to blog talk radio that's b-l-o-g-t-a-l-k blogtalkradio.com forward slash Renford and view the archives there of shows going back over four years and there's shows every night of the week on, on there with some uh, great host uh, talk shows. And then on Wednesday night, we have the Laws of Material Wealth Personal Development Program. Support material is sent out each week, and then we cover that material on the show. And finally, I want to invite you to go to iam-cor.org, iam-cor.org. This is the virtual campus of the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. You can view the courses. There are three ebooks you can download free. There's the Lightways easing that you can get there. And important for those of you who are writers and aspire to have your book into print, if you go to the I Am Press section, you'll be able to download 
the author package which explains in detail or at least introduces the three phases that we go through that we work with new authors in seeing your dreams in print. So I want to invite you to do that. Welcome back to the uh, show, Mona. Tell Thank us, you, Jim. Tell us a little bit about how this book is put together. How's it structured? I mean, what's its purpose aside from uh, trying to help people stop drinking? Yes. Well, stopping, stopping drinking, of course, is just the beginning yeah. of it. This, this book was put together um, not very easily and haphazardly and was, was sent back and forth to Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson and several other people who finally put it together in what it is today, which is several, which it has a preface, preface like other books, and, and has several uh, forewords to each edition, which all of them have good information. Then it begins, it has 11 chapters in here, which are, uh, the first chapter is Bill Wilson's story of how he got sober. He did not get sober in AA, which, even though he was one of the founders. He was sober when he came to AA. And he was sober even when he found Dr. Bob, right? He had not been drinking for some time. But still he had enough sense to know he needed that continual help. That, that's an yes. amazing thing. Yeah. It is amazing. He had stayed sober in New York and at, by talking with the Oxford Group people, with Theosophical Society people, and whatever he could do to stay sober. And it was very shaky by the time he got to Akron, Ohio and met Dr. Bob. Especially with the disappointment. Not the, getting the deal. Not getting the deal <laughs> for his stock brokerage and mm. and running out of money. And, and he found um, Dr. Bob, which was fortunate, very fortunate for all of For both of them. All, for for all, everyone today. And for all of us, for millions of mm -hmm. us today who might not even be around if, uh, if it wasn't for that. But the book starts with his story then of how he got sober. And then it goes into uh, there is a solution on, on uh, talking about how the program of Alcoholics Anonymous solves the, the problems and moves on and then when, when, when they explain the solution, they talk more about alcoholism and what it is and, and how their recovery works. Then it talks, since it is not a, a, a religious book, it talks about agnostics and that agnostics are uh, members of the group and can, can be there. And then it moves into how it works, which is where the 12 steps are laid out. Mm. And, and this particular part is read at almost every meeting, which starts out with rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. It says that those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, which is usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves and, and, and facing their own reality. There are, they are not at fault. They, they seem to have been born in that way. And it says our stories in, in the back of this book disclose in a general way what what they used to be like, what happened, and what they're like now. That's the outline for all of the stories that are told. And then it goes to the, here are the steps we took, which are suggested, 
as a program of recovery, and they are the 12 steps, which I think you have a copy of. Yeah, well, I had, um, um, there. I had set it uh, aside there. I thought you might want to. You, would you like for me to read those? Yes, why don't you just yeah. re read those? He says, here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. May 3 made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. 4 made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And this has to do with uh, wrongs that we've felt like that we've done to someone, right? That, yes. That's that inventory. Yes. Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. And I think that's interesting that it's to another human being. You also have to do that. That's good. Yes, we are. They, they say that they are only as sick as their secrets. Mm -hmm. So the idea is no secrets. No secrets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed. No, I got that wrong a while ago. I, I was, this is a different one. Well, it comes out yeah. of that yeah. other step, though. When they do a, a searching and fearless moral inventory, they talk about in that inventory will be the people, places, and things that have happened that are wrong and that they've done right. Mm -hmm. It's like taking an inventory in your store. Of what you got plenty you, of and what you don't. What, what you need to throw out and what right. you need to keep. Mm -hmm. Number nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure, injure them or others. 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him. Uh, and they keep saying, as we understood them, to not have some specific idea there that one must adhere to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, prove our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And finally, 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Yes. Th that th These steps are an outline for or living. Many people study this this idea of living who are not alcoholics or not drug addicts or food addicts or sex addicts or whatever gambling addicts, whatever the, the favorite is. Uh, they, they study these and the first three there are just armchair steps, armchair steps that you just think about them and get ready to do the others. Then the action ones are when the inventory, personal inventory begins and you go down through making uh, direct amends wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. You don't want to go, uh, what, what, uh, what Bill used to say is you don't, if, if you had an affair with, with your friend's wife you don't want to go tell your friend that wrong because that would just injure it. What you do is a living amends. You stop doing the things that you did that were harmful. And that, that living amends, you simply change your life and go from there. The, the last three are the maintenance steps where you continue to do this inventory. Some do it at night in a meditation and see what happened during the day 
and, and what they need to do tomorrow to correct that. And then to carry the message to, uh, this book says to alcoholics, the, the other organizations will say to food addicts or, to, or simply to others carry the message to others and that means we go out into the world into all the people who are out there and live by the principles and it is without any intent uh, like proselyting or like bringing someone to your church or so forth uh, or bringing them to Christ or whatever it is simply to show to show mostly by example to, 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 to smile at each other, to be nice to your neighbors, to not uh, yell at each other. If, you, if we had difference, differences, uh, the important thing would be that I not get in your face and make demands, mm -hmm. but that I close my mouth, breathe through my nose as an action and think about it for 24 hours. You know, you know, Grandma used to say, sleep on it first. And, and that's the idea of doing it, is to give it some time and then come back in a day or two and discuss it and what, what is going on or simply change and let it go. Some things do not have to be settled, like Grandma used to say, now we're gonna get this settled once and for all. Some things don't have to be settled. They simply are self-settling. When you, when you change the way you do things, your life just gets better. You move to, uh, it's a process. It's here. a process. process. The, on page 164 in this book, it's, it says, it talks about that. It ends the book by saying, um, Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. And that was an important piece that was added to this book, uh, Jim, by one of the, the people who were anonymously writing the book, was everyone has their own idea of what is God, or higher power is used in 12-step programs. It may be the universal spirit. It, it, it may be whatever puts the leaves back on the trees and gets the right ones on the maple trees and the mm -hmm. right ones on the oak trees, which I couldn't do. I'd have them all mixed up after a few years. But whatever your idea is of a higher power, and in the beginning it may just be your support group, your, the AA group, your group of friends at church, your group of friends in the neighborhood, that may be the higher power, and it goes on from there. But it says abandon yourself to this power. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you will surely meet some of us and, and this is the, the line, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. It, it doesn't say to happy destiny. There is not a destination. The, the journey is trudging the road. Just mm -hmm. keep moving. Some days you can run, some days you dance, and some days you just trudge, but you go through it with, with the spirit and and most people are as happy as they make up their minds to be. Abraham Lincoln said that. I didn't just make that up. Mm -hmm. but, but it's true. We can be happy in the face of problems. But we can still approach our problems in a comfortable, happy way. We don't have to strike at them or fight with each other to, to solve them. Well, there's no government program, there's no other organization, there's nothing that's had the kind of effect that, that AA has had and, and the success that they've had and, and so many people to witness to it. Uh, you, uh, as a matter of fact, have been a long time president of a 
an organization that conducts retreats. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I could. It's modeled after, its business model is modeled after the, the model of Alcoholics Anonymous. When we, when we started it some almost 50 years ago, uh, it, uh, we, we set it up as similar to that model. And then I, after I became president about 25 or 30 years ago, uh, I talked with the people at AA about how they were organized and how it worked because it works so well there. Their model, they do not own property. All of the groups, all of the AA groups are autonomous. There are no charge to be a member of AA. The, the, they're, they uh, go and are supported financially by their voluntary contributions, which is the same as our Serenity Retreat League. It's, it's voluntary on, on how much is, is, is paid in. And AA has functioned now for 75 years, or whatever it is, since 1935 yeah. until today, and they function very well. Uh, they they rent a a very a large business building in New York City, uh, and they they are they pay their people uh, comparable salaries for other New York businesses. Mm -hmm. They're very professional, very tidy, very organized, and willing to conduct tours through at at any time. So we modeled Serenity Retreat League after that, where our, we have about 2,000 people a year who come to the retreats. And at one time, I registered all of them through the home office. And then gradually, after the retreats got going, and I, I gradually turned them over to local uh, captains and and leaders and until today they are all self-supporting they send um, voluntary donations to run the home office to pay for our computers and the utilities and and space that it and and somehow it always shows up and works very well and we don't we don't charge anything. We have a website that they register their retreats if they want to. And that model works. We don't have offices. I mean, we don't ha own property, as AA doesn't own property. If AA owned property in, well, we're in Memphis, Tennessee in 2013, and there are many, many AA, Al-Anon, 12-step groups here. If they owned property, you would see more 12-step buildings than filling stations <laughs> in, in, in Memphis because there are just that many people. Um, they have uh, infiltrated, if you will, all businesses. Uh, the, the members are anonymous and um, the anonymity is for a purpose. Uh, we do the same in the Serenity Retreat League, which is not, not as anonymous as AA, uh, but it is for the purpose of ego, keeping the ego down. Um, we, in AA, they don't say, well, I am I am Jane Doe, and I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I recommend Brand X coffee, which is the best in all the world. <laughs> and the company pays me big money for advertising on the big TV network. Then, if I, Jane Doe, go out and get drunk and get arrested and get on the news, I have not damaged only I've damaged AA, I've damaged Brand X coffee. Mm -hmm. So 
we are anonymous at the level of radio, TV, films, and so on. Um, the, the people who are alcoholics don't say that in, in the topmost public level they, and within their own groups. Dr. Bob wrote the anonymity part of it and, and what he said was, we are anonymous at the topmost public level and any anonymity at that level or below that level breaks the pledge. Like in our own group, we need to know who each other is. And in our neighborhood, they need to know if, if there is a recovering alcoholic there. So your neighbors, if they have a problem, will know where to go. Now you're, you, even at this juncture, you're, you've been involved here recently in a new group meeting. Mm -hmm. Just starting up, just they're, they're, I guess it's just pretty constant. New and starting up somewhere all the time. All the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, they they start, uh, and 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 I like going to the open meetings. This is an open, a new open meeting that I have have been going to just to show up and because I love this program, and it they start up every day and they stop every day. They will register with the World Service Office probably and send some donations in and they get information. Once you register, you, as the Serenity Retreat does, people do and the um, 12, other 12-step 12 people do, you get information from the Home Office on the website, on our Facebook. and. That's how it works and continues to work. Would you like to um, take a few moments and address the viewing audience? Uh, any message that you have from your long experience in this type of work? Um, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. Hmm. I, I uh, professionally, I uh, have been a family counselor. I'm. I'm retired now as a family counselor, which mostly means I don't charge mm -hmm. anymore. But I, I don't know how to not work. I don't know how to not, not do that. But the, 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 the way it works is to constantly maintain, the, the, this book says we we are, we continue to grow based on the daily maintenance of our spiritual condition. And, and Jim, that means we are constantly aware of how we are interacting with people, places, and things. For instance, in my own home, um, I have some meetings there. Uh, uh, at various times, just support groups, uh, infor information groups, book groups, and people come and live at my house sometimes. They'll be there for a year or so and then move on to, to where they go. But I have guidelines for my house that are just basically be nice. There's, there's no no yelling at each other or on the phone to anyone. It's, if you have an issue to talk about, you do it quietly with, with each other. The, you, you tidy. You pick up after yourself. Don't leave things around. You have refrigerator privileges at, at all times because I don't do a lot of service. I, I'll cook sometimes, but if, if you're there and you feel like cooking, I'm happy to have that happen. So, but you clean up and keep the house clean. There's no smoking or drinking uh, on the premises, and anyone who's, who lives there for a while, um, not no smokers or, or drug users are, can live there because it, it smells and it changes the attitude. So I maintain